So in your Bibles, in the English translation, it says hospitality. But in the Greek translation, which uh, the Christian scriptures in the Koine Greek, hospitality is made up of two words in the Greek, philo and xenia. Anybody know what philo means? Love. Love, but not just any kind of love. It means kinship love, right? So that's where I get Philadelphia from. So city of brotherly love. So you might know it as brotherly love. So philo and then xenia. Anybody know what xenia means? Xenophobia. Sound familiar? Foreign visitor. Stranger. Yeah, foreign visitor, foreigner, stranger. It literally translates stranger. So in the Greek, when you read the word hospitality, it literally translates a kinship love for strangers. That's what it means. So then when we read things like um, Romans chapter 12, verses 13 to 15, where Paul writes to church in Rome and he says, share with the saints in their needs, pursue hospitality. Paul is saying, I want you to pursue a kinship love for strangers. That's different than pineapples, biscuit and gravy and Christmas pajamas and warm welcome. Like this is pursuing. Now, the, now I'm a nerd. So the Greek word for pursue means aggressively hunt after. So Paul is saying in, in, in the Koine Greek language, aggressively hunt after a kinship love for strangers. <laughs> That's so anti-cultural right now. That's like anti-everything right now, right? So he says, share with the saints in their needs, pursue hospitality, bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse, rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. So here's how I would like for you to think about hospitality. It's not just any kind of kinship love for strangers. It's pursuing a life with strangers, with generosity, compassion, and solidarity. All right. Or you could say it this way. Hospitality as philoxenia can be understood as the practice of faithful presence towards strangers with generosity, compassion, and solidarity in the struggle for dignity, worth, and empowerment. So I, I get that, like with the whole like biblical narrative, which we're not going to be able to unpack, right? Um, but if you think about it, pursuing a kinship love for strangers, and then Paul in Romans 12, verse 15 says, rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. That's a command of solidarity. That means when Hannah is hurting, I am hurting. Even if I don't feel the hurt, I enter into Hannah's story if Hannah invites me and I listen to what's going on in Hannah's life. And I take that in as my own, not in some weird, unhealthy, you know, need to call somebody kind of like creepy way. But I take that into myself as if like when Hannah's hurting, I'm hurting. If Ben's hurting. I listen to Ben. If I don't, I don't say to Ben, Ben, that's not a big deal. I don't dismiss Ben's hurt. I don't dismiss Ben's anger or his rage. That's what America does. It's not what the kingdom of God does. I receive what's going on with Ben and I enter into that space with solidarity. Or if Carlton's having a great day and he's like, woohoo, it's awesome. He found like, I don't know, like a new mask he can wear or something because that's what excites us these days. I found a mask that matches my shirt. Right. Like like so he gets really excited or whatever. We may not we're not going to be like, yo, yeah, like, like whatever. Like we should be like, yeah, yeah. Mass that match shirts. Those are awesome. Um, and then we can go. No, they're not. But I mean, we can at least, do, you know, it's like we enter into this space of communal celebration and lament. It's about solidarity. It's about solidarity. But here's the thing. It's not about solidarity with people we know. It's about generos generosity, compassion, and solidarity with people we don't. So when we see the person walking around with streets of Williamsburg with their luggage on their back, it's about looking at that with a sense of humanity and a common humanity with the eyes of Christ that says, that's not right. But it's not just looking. It's then allowing the Spirit of God to convict me to do something about it. Because the word rejoice, the word we, those are verbs, right? Like a kinship love for strangers, the pursuit, the aggressively hunt after that generosity, that compassion, that solidarity for, in the struggle for dignity, worth, and empowerment. Now, here's the thing. 
in the ancient Near Eastern tradition, hospitality was a moral obligation. It, it, was a, it, was a, it was a foundation upon which all morality stood. So if you were inhospitable in the ancient Near Eastern culture or even, then you were considered an immoral person. Now, in Greco-Roman culture, hospitality came about upward mobility. It was about leveraging your power, privilege, and position for more power, privilege, and position. But in the ancient Near Eastern culture and in our biblical tradition, there's a reboot. There's a subversion that, that the Apostle Paul, I think, especially is trying to, trying to bring about that says, look, whatever power, privilege, and position um, you know, Dell has, Dell should leverage that for the good of somebody else, even strangers. Now, how could this, how could recapturing this definition, this understanding of hospitality change the way you do life on campus? How could it change the way, let me talk about what Jeffrey talked about. How can it change the way we talk about political things? Look, we got to learn how to talk about politics, how we've gotten this mess in the first place. Kingdom of God shouldn't be afraid to have hard conversations because we have an identity that grounds us. It's when we're immature in our faith and immature in our life that we can't handle this stuff. But if we took a kinship love for strangers and had these conversations, how could that change everything? I mean, I think it could, especially if we were trying to seek solidarity, especially if we were trying to identify and empathize with people's hurts. It would change how we love our neighbor because it would change how we love a stranger. It would change how we see our strangers on the street and we would see them as neighbors. People wouldn't be problems to solve or projects to fix or in the Christian tradition, prospects to save. People would be persons to be embraced just as they are, not as they should be. It would change things. In my 20 years of walking with people out of homelessness into what we call holistic sufficiency with 3E, you inevitably confront all of these particular systems, systems of racial injustice, all types of poverty systems, all types of structural and systemic realities that perpetuate uh, denial of strangers to have a full life because we live in a culture of xenophobia, which means what? Fear of strangers, right? So I want you to think about it. Every day you and I wake up to put our feet on the ground. We are a people who are supposed to be committed to a kinship love of strangers living in a society that tells us strangers are to be feared. Strangers are threats. And fear drives out love, even though John teaches us that love drives out fear. So everywhere I've ever gone in 20 years to work in this world of social displacement, inevitably, inevitably, it's not about the money. You feel me? It's not about the money to house people. It's not about the resources. They may all be minimal, but it's never about those things. You know what it's about? It's about seeing the stranger as an other, somehow devalued, dehumanized, or disposable in light of who I am. We call it, in its most um, acceptable and palatable forms, we call it nimbyism, not in my backyardism, that we don't have it here, right? It's not that bad here. All right, wherever you are, wherever your hometown is, wherever you land. See, here's what I'm trying to say, y'all. What we talk about tonight carries out into your post-college world. And how you practice your faith in this city is the school for which you learn how to practice your faith when you leave this city. Campus ministry is not a, not a club to be a part of. I was a campus ministry for eight years. It's fine. It's beautiful. I did weddings, all kinds of great things. But what I'm saying is this is your school, campus ministry, the church that you're a part of here locally. You need to root in a church here locally. This is your training ground for life now that leads you post-college. This is where you get formed. This is where you get to practice your faith. When you see a man walking down the street, don't just think that's a Williamsburg problem. If you're living here with us, it is our collective concern. Why? Because above all things, we're Christians and we're called to pursue a kinship love for strangers. And that starts now. Nowhere here does it say a kinship love for strangers when we all leave. And here's the thing. We need you. We need you. We need you to see our neighbor as someone made in the image of God. We need you because you can light a fire. God can use you to light a fire that burns throughout the city. 
and that rekindles the compassion and the generosity because we are a people who believe in a kinship love for strangers. We are a people who are commanded to do so. Now, this story is anchored deeply within Scripture, but it even goes into the Jewish tradition. So the writer of Hebrews, in writing the Hebrew letter in the last chapter, said, Let brotherly love continue. Don't neglect to show hospitality. Don't neglect to show a kinship love for strangers. For by doing so, some have welcomed angels as guests without knowing it. Now, really quickly, I'm going to write this in. That statement is a wink and a nod to a story in the Jewish tradition back in Genesis 18, 1 through 8. We don't have time to go through that, but I want you to look at verse 3. And I want you to see how the text flows. Don't neglect to show hospitality, for by doing so, uh, some have welcomed angels as guests without knowing it. Remember those in prison as though you were in prison with them. That's solidarity. And people who are mistreated as if you were in their place. That is solidarity. Another word for that might be empathy. But the biblical word for both is hospitality. Don't let anybody tell you empathy isn't biblical. It's as embedded in the word of hospitality as anything could be. Which is why then I think Jesus, when talking to his peeps, separated them all into this story and begin to talk and to begin to tell them this story of how things were going to work in Matthew chapter 25, verse 31. And you can see it with me. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he sits on this glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate them one from another. Just as shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He'll put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. And then the king will say to those on his right, come who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. And let me pause. What, what imagination is Jesus capturing with this when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he'll sit in his throne business? What's the imagination? Anybody want to guess? No? No guesses? It's a judgment scene. This is a judgment scene. There's no way around it. It's within a judgment context, and it's a judgment scene. And I share this with you so you can see the heart of Jesus. So in verse 35, for I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in, and I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you took care of me. I was in prison, and you visited me. You seen any common themes? Prison, mistreated, stranger. So then the righteous will answer, Lord, when do we see you hungry and feed you, thirsty, give you something to drink? When do we see you a stranger and take you in without clothes and clothe you? When do we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the, and the king will answer them. Notice that he says the king. He doesn't see buddy Jesus. He doesn't say homeboy Jesus. He doesn't say Lord Jesus. He doesn't say Jesus, my savior. He doesn't say Jesus, my boyfriend. He doesn't say, you know, all the things that contemporary worship songs want to make us seem like. He doesn't say all that. He says the king. The king will answer them, truly I'll tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. But I want to tell you something. The right language in the original language is to me. Whatever you did for them, you did. Everybody say it, to me. And that's the point. That's the level of solidarity. All right, you ready? God wants to welcome us into his life so much that he becomes one of us. It doesn't get much more solidarity than that. And he wants to give us all of himself and, and, and life now and forever with him. It doesn't become much more generous than that. 
And then after pronouncing that God's kingdom will welcome all who repent and believe, Jesus invites his first apprentices to learn the way of God's welcome alongside him. And he teaches the worshipers in synagogues, heals unclean, tormented people, journeys through Galilean neighborhood, touches lepers with his own hands, shows compassion to the vulnerable, shares a table with those the religious establishment called sinners. Jesus challenges the narrow definitions of hospitality and inclusion, and he presses hearers to move outward to the margins of society and to welcome those with whom they least want to have connections, especially those incapable of reciprocity. And then he teaches all of his followers not to view people marginalized and displaced as disposable by the standards of society, but as people to be joined with. And so the friend of sinners, Jesus, is found in the presence of liars, thieves, prostitutes, and those who don't believe. He's found in the presence of the rich, the poor, the powerless, and the divorced, the widow, the child, the religious elite, and those left out. He's, he's found in the presence of murderers, the immigrant, the racist, the unrepentant. And by welcoming and embracing sinners, Jesus reveals that contrary to the mainstream religious narrative of exclusion and inhospitality, God is willing to make room in his life and welcome all. Jesus is extending the compassion and generosity to all who are strangers and far from home with God. And that's your text for Ephesians 2, that God welcomes all of us home. And in doing so, tells us to follow him and do the same. And what I wanted to tell all of you beautiful people is that it starts now. And it won't end. So please, please see that this call on our lives is right now. And this is a time, this is a gift that in your ministry of study, you have a chance to learn how to do this within community. You have a chance to extend generosity and compassion through this practice of faithful presence, sense of solidarity in all of our neighbors' struggle for dignity, worth, and empowerment. You have a chance to change things. So 3E Restoration Incorporated is now this national 501c3 nonprofit that has ministries in San Francisco, Dallas, Texas, Tupelo, Mississippi, Fredericksburg, Virginia, Chester, Virginia, and other places. And it's crazy because I never even meant to start a nonprofit. We were just trying to be a church pastoring, you know, we we're just trying to be a church loving our neighbors in our city. And as we were loving our neighbors in our city, this inner collaborative, this interfaith collaborative asked us to show them what we were doing. And I came and we did that. And then 17 different churches wanted to learn how to do what we were doing with walking with our friends um, into holistic sufficiency. And so we piloted something together. And once that pilot went through, three of the churches wanted to stick it and do it themselves. And so I had to start this nonprofit and hire this executive director and put together this board of directors so that we could train these churches to do what Williamsburg Christian Church was already doing. And then it grew into this thing. And now we have nine churches in town and we're in like four or five different states and several different cities. And how did it start? It started out of the work of a church. It didn't start by building a nonprofit first. It started out of the work of God's people taking seriously the call of Romans 12, Hebrews 13, and Matthew 25. When I was a campus minister at the University of Georgia, I started meeting some friends who were living in the woods. And our church had these spaghetti suffers. Raise your hand if you ever did these spaghetti suffers in church. Yeah. So I noticed that as always we had way too much spaghetti, mostly because it was always nasty. But nonetheless, you know, they tried to get better and then every now and then. But I noticed that we were throwing away all the spaghetti. And I was a campus minister right now. My wife, Allison, was pregnant. And I mean, like super duper pregnant. Um, and and so I, I thought, well, instead of wasting all the spaghetti, what if I went to like Sam's Club? Um, some of you may know it as, you know, like a version, like a Costco and bought these clamshells. Right, like, and, and put the leftover spaghetti in the clamshells and then delivered it to some people in the woods. And so my, my big, I shouldn't say big, my beautiful pregnant wife um, and I grabbed clamshells of spaghetti and we walked down bridges and into the woods and we just left the spaghetti and they were like, 
what's the, and we were like, I was like, here's some spaghetti. And they're like, why did you give us spaghetti? I said, well, I think if Jesus was walking by, he'd turn grass into spaghetti because you're hungry. So since I can't do the trick of turning grass into spaghetti, I thought I'd bring you spaghetti. And we just brought spaghetti. And, and it was just me and my, my beautifully pregnant wife. And we were walking through there and we would sit there. And every now and then they would say, hey, you want to eat with us? And we're like, not really. I did the spaghetti's gross, but I'll eat the spaghetti with you because I know you're hungry. Really. So we ate the spaghetti and we just ate with them. And then Allison got to, um, um, too pregnant to walk down like into the bridge and stuff with me. So I had to call a college student um, who was like one of my interns. Um, and, you know, I don't know if y'all know what interns in campus ministry do, but they like make coffee, they get copies um, and, and they, wait, y'all have a better program than I did, I think. Okay, I see. Um, so my interns were, were, were mistreated. Um, so, so I, I invited my interns to come in. It's just me and two, two guys. And we would take the food down. And before we knew it, then three college students wanted to join us. And before we knew it, 15 college students wanted to join us. Okay. You really hear me? And we kept going down. Then every Wednesday night we would bring spaghetti and it would be like 45 of us in all these different places. And it would take three hours. And then eventually people started coming to faith. And everything changed. And even on Thanksgiving breaks, we'd have college students throwing $2 and $10 from wherever they were. This was like before Venmo. This is when you have to do this thing called checks. Now, checks are these pieces of paper, and you have to write the numbers in it, and then you sign it at the bottom. And that's how students would have to do this back in the day, and they'd send checks, and we'd buy pizza, rain or snow. Well, it never snowed because it was Georgia. So rain or harder rain. We would always bring food and we would sit down with our friends and then check this out. You ready? This is the last story and I'm done. So then they started coming to faith, right? And start baptizing all these friends of ours. And then they started coming to church and it completely screwed the church up, like completely screwed the church up. Like the church was super mad because everybody loves people in poverty until people in poverty start coming, right? Like that's how it is. Like, oh, I have a heart for the poor until the poor start asking you for stuff. And then that's how it was. And they started coming and literally guys... And guys, like I would see people like all of my friends on the streets would sit there and they would sit in the big pew and they'd sit together because they all knew each other and we'd sit with them. And then I would see members of the church go to the bathroom and then sit somewhere else. That was happening. And then we had to have hard conversations. And when my wife and I finally left this campus ministry, we had way I'd witnessed so many friends living on the streets come to faith that they had to hire a pastoral position just to disciple them. And guess who they hired? My intern. And then he became the founding director of training for 3E Restoration Incorporated because I eventually hired him out. Here's what I'm trying to say, y'all. Everything I know about social displacement happened when I was in campus ministry. And then everything I witnessed grow into what I've seen now happen through the local church. But it starts with one thing. Hospitality. If we can't extend a kinship love to one another, there's no way we're going to be able to extend a kinship love to strangers. So it starts with me and it starts with you. And right now, this unbelievably wonky political season and the enemy making machine that we are living in right now is a master's class on hospitality. The answer is not avoidance. It's not avoidance y'all. It's what gets us in this mess in the first place. The answer is pressing in and taking our faith seriously and trusting that the spirit in me is the spirit in you working between both of us wanting to make us into who we can be by the love of God. All right, that's it. So I don't have like a grand conclusion. Ta-da! That, that's all I got. All right. So so <laughs> it's 702. And uh I know that people have things to do. It's like uh y'all have got a lot of homework and stuff. But um uh if anybody has like a, a, a follow-up question, how to connect a couple dots here, something that you've heard and you're like, man, how would I go about blank or something like that? I don't know. Any question that y'all like to throw Pastor Fred's way? Anybody's got anything? <laughs> the
the only question is when can we log off that's what we want like we oh. okay all right fred thank you for being with us tonight hey y'all thanks for letting me be here it's good to see some of y'all well it's good to see all y'all let me rephrase good to see all of you but good to see some faces i know that was that was borderline rude jeffrey my bad <laughs> good to see you guys <laughs> Wait, All right, Carlton. Carlton, yeah, okay. Um, Pastor Fred, yeah, bro. I, I, my question is, when do you, when do you, when do you, um, like, how do you, like, like, how did God um start like making you into the, start changing the way, like, changing your heart? How, when did you start to see God changing your heart, or? Yeah. So the brief version is when I was a stockbroker, I kept uh, every, every day to work and every day from work, I saw the same man living on a, uh, sitting on a street corner with a buggy full of stuff. And one day I just decided to um, take courage and stop. And I sat with Mr. Clifford silent for three minutes, four minutes, five minutes. I don't know. I wasn't keeping score. And we just sat there. He wouldn't say a word. I didn't I'd try to talk. He wouldn't talk. And then I started to walk away and he held his hand out and introduced himself as Clifford and I introduced myself as Fred and I started visiting him every Sunday and everything changed for me. Hmm. At that point, homelessness wasn't a political issue. It was a person named Clifford. And every Sunday night when church service was over, I would drive around town trying to find every friend living on the streets I could. And I didn't try to fix them. I didn't give them a Bible. I didn't give them food. I mean, if they wanted something, we'd go grip something together. I gave some money. I did all that. Yes, I did all that. But my point wasn't to save them. My point was to be with them and learn from them. They became my teachers. Fred, I'd, I'd like to say, I'd like to ask a question. Like, um, I know that 3E is, uh, you know, has a, it's an organization. I mean, basically, structure follows passion. And you were talking there in that story earlier just about passion and getting after and all this stuff. And then all the structure is now in place and stuff. So say if somebody just like one of these students five years from now or five weeks from now just comes to you and say like, what does it mean to be in 3E and how do I be, how do I do what you're talking about? What does that look like in our yeah. community of Williamsburg? Yeah, like I would say to you guys, practically speaking, that you never, you know, you never do it by yourself. Always go in twos, no less than twos. Never, ever by yourself. Always in twos. Always in twos. And if you see someone, um, you know, stop and just introduce yourself and hear their name. I mean, I'm serious, Jeffrey. Like, it's really a simple, it's the most human thing we can do. Um, and then, I mean, obviously, I think, um, you, know, I, you know, a lot of people have lots of opinions about things like panhandling and all that. Proverbs 19, 17, kindness to the poor is a loan to the Lord and he'll reward the lender. Your job isn't to qualify who gets it. Your job is just to give it because that's what, that's what, that's what resurrection people do. Um, when we give to people, we are given to Jesus. Kindness to the poor is alone to the Lord, and he shall reward the lender. You should look it up. It's a, phen uh, it's a phenomenal text. Um, and just you, just, you just, you just be generous. You just be compassionate, and you be human. And you don't think that you can save them or help them, whoever them are, and you just be with them. It's about faithful presence. It's one of the, one of the ideas of, of hospitality is just being faithfully present. And then, Jeffrey, to answer your question even more specifically, the Lord will tell you what to do. You'll learn. Believe me, you join God in his pursuit of loving people, and he will sign you up. And before you know it, you could be starting a nonprofit. And if you ever need to start one, call me, and I'll tell you all the wrong ways to do it so you'll know the right way. Amen. All right. Well, very good. Um, Pastor Fred, would you be willing to stick around for a minute after we close in prayer if people want to talk to you for just a few more minutes yeah, so, man, I love that very good well let's let's close I, I don't know that we have really uh finished anything here tonight except we've just stirred the pot a little bit i do hope that the holy spirit would lead us to keep asking some questions and think about us and maybe as a as a fellowship where are we on these kinds of things how do we get involved how do we do this and i'm having some conversations with pastor fred in the future too about some of this as well um Interestingly enough, Greater City was something that kind of started amongst a bunch of BCMers and a few others from IV and yep. stuff like that. Greater Harmony, Janine is very much active in that, and Sam and Janine, Sam and Brielle, I think, is active in that. 
I'm probably missing a few others. But those are things that are happening locally that students are involved in as well. And get involved with Greater City. Greater City is doing the Pen Pals ministry right now and some Instacart stuff. There are still some meaningful and socially distantly responsible ways to be involved. Find ways to get involved in the things that are already happening rather than trying to start your own. Amen. Amen. Let's, uh, let's have a closing word of prayer. Lord, your word is uh, disturbing at times. <laughs> Um, and because it seems like it's got to mess us up a little bit. It's going to change some way we already think, some habits that we, we already have, uh, some plans that we've already made in our lives. And yet, God, we also, sometimes I think we get in touch with it, that there's nothing you've ever asked us to do that will not be rewarded in some way deeply in our souls and in the eternity hereafter. Lord, lead us, help us to see that following you anywhere is a pearl of great price worth it all and i pray god that you would lead us to be people that just walk a little differently from this world and do what it is that you've called us to do because we are not citizens of this country or of this world first we are citizens of heaven and that is our identity god lead us to be your people and we pray that in jesus name amen amen Thanks, everyone. If you want to stick around and talk a little bit with Pastor Fred, you are welcome. Thank you. The Exodus is on. <laughs>